World of Frankenstein, 20 years after Victor Frankenstein passed away. Scientists came from all over the world to Paris to try to unlock the secret to build another monster. Do you want to learn how to play Abomination the Air of Frankenstein board game? In this video, we're going to take you through the full rules for this game, and if you stay tuned till the end, you can pick up some tips along the way. Coming up. Hi, it's Taryn. And Stella from Ipul University. We bring you a variety of quality board game videos. So if you're new here, please consider subscribing and do hit the bell to be notified of when we post new videos. Now, let's get to the rules of Abomination, the Heir of Frankenstein, game by Dan Blasher, published by Playhead Games. The year is 1819 and it's 20 years after the original story of Frankenstein was set. Frankenstein's creature is still searching for a life partner and he has brought a series of scientists into Paris some at their will and some against it, in order to help him. The players play the role of these scientists, trying to create a new creature for Frankenstein's original creature to be with. Through the game, the players will be sending their scientists and their assistants out into Paris to get the resources and materials they need to create this creature. Through the game, players will be spending all of the organic materials that they've been collecting in order to start and then complete the parts of their creatures before discharging Leiden jars in an attempt to shock the creature to life. Players will gain points for all of the parts of their creature that they create and bring to life as well as for maintaining their humanity and for their reputation and expertise. The game plays over a maximum of 12 rounds or until one player has brought his or her creature completely to life, and the player who scores the highest score in that time wins the game. Now, I'm going to warn you in advance of this explanation that the theme of this game is a bit gritty and macabre. In order to create your creatures, you're going to be going out into Paris, sourcing human cadavers of various levels of freshness. The game doesn't shy away from this, and some of the graphics are a little bit gory. But it is still all in the fun of the game, and we will proceed to explain this game as thematically as we can. I'm not going to step you through the full setup of this game. I'll leave you to follow the instructions in the rulebook to do this. Each player receives an empty player board, one of each of the help cards in the game, a randomly drawn character card, a number of coins equal to the number of players in the game, and three meeples, one of the larger scientist meeples and two of the smaller assistant meeples. Each of these three dials is set to the starting position, which is shown with the little diamond icon, zero for humanity and one each for reputation and expertise. Check your character card, because in addition to the special power, you may get to set one of your dials a little bit higher at the start of the game. Randomly choose a first player who gets this first player marker and you're now ready to play. The game is played over a maximum of 12 rounds and each round is broken into these four phases. First the event phase, then the city phase, then the lab phase and then the reset phase. In the event phase, the first player will draw one of these event or encounter cards from the deck and then resolve it. And this will either modify some of the rules that affect everybody in this round, or it could be an encounter which targets a specific player with a positive or negative effect. Then you'll proceed to the city phase, and this is where players will be sending their scientists and assistants out to the various locations around Paris and taking the actions associated with those spaces. This is a round-based worker placement phase, in that players will put a worker on a space, immediately take the action, and then that space will be occupied for the rest of the round. And this is where players will be getting most of their resources from which they'll build the creatures. Then follows the lab phase, and here players will take three types of actions. Discard the materials that they've been gathering in order to build body parts. Discharge Leiden jars in order to attempt to animate any completed body parts, or preserve materials to sell later. Then in the reset phase, any unpreserved materials will decompose, 
with some of it needing to be discarded, and you'll reset the board for the next round. So let's now look at all of these steps in detail. The first phase of each round is the event phase. And in this phase, whoever currently has the first player marker draws the first card from underneath this flash card that's on top showing the creature. This is done because each of these cards is double sided and which side you resolve depends on which round you're currently in. There are a few different types of cards you might encounter when doing this. An event is going to impact one of the action locations on the board in either a positive or negative way for the round. For example, this one takes away any cadavers which would have been at the hospital space. The second type of card you may come across in this deck is an encounter, and thematically this is an encounter between your character and, usually, the creature. If an encounter says now as its trigger, then you will resolve this immediately, and you will work out which player is targeted by the encounter based on the description under target. If there are multiple players who meet the requirements of the target, then whoever has the first player marker gets to choose the target. This is one of the perks of being first player. Then read through the text, and at one point the card may direct you to an entry. This entry refers to one of the specific little stories beginning on page 10 at the back of the rulebook. Follow the entry or the card through to its conclusion, and the target of the encounter either gains or loses the benefits that the card shows. The other type of encounter that you may come across is one where the trigger is a location. When there's a trigger location, the first player who drew that card doesn't read anything else. He or she simply keeps that card secret in his or her hand. Then, the first time one of the other players visits that location, the player holding the encounter reveals it and then resolves it. Thematically, you can think of this as the creature lying in wait at that location. The player holding the card is always immune from a location triggered encounter. There are two other possible effects in the event phase. If the event card drawn shows this guillotine icon, it means there's been a public execution. Place cadaver cards from the public square deck onto the public square spaces. One in a two player game, or two in a three or four player game. Finally, if the event card shows a lightning storm icon, all players may flip over any uncharged laden jars to the charged side. You're now ready for the city phase. In the city phase, beginning with the player with the first player token and going clockwise around the table, players take it in turns to place one worker onto one of the worker placement spaces on the board and immediately carry out the effect of that location. This phase will continue until all players have run out of workers. There are two types of worker placement space on the board. One showing this icon can only be occupied by a player's larger scientist meeple, while one showing this icon can be occupied by either a scientist or an assistant. There are also some action spaces which can be occupied by either sort of meeple, but will have a different effect depending on which meeple is placed. The benefit that a player gets at any location is printed above that space, while the cost, if any, is printed below. A player cannot normally place a worker onto a worker placement space which already has a worker. However, there is a limited opportunity to do so using the bribe and bump space at the bottom of the board. As long as there is at least one available location here, the player may move to an action space that contains another player's meeple, move that other player's meeple to the bump space, and then the bumper must pay the bumpy the amount of money shown at the bottom of that space. In this case, it's one coin. A player may bump his or her own meeple, and may do this for free, because it counts as paying the coin back to himself or herself. Once all of the bribe and bump spaces are full, no other players may bump during this round. There will be a different number of bump spaces available at each player count. The only space which works a little bit differently is the first player space. A player may go here to take the first player marker for the next round, and the player cannot be bumped off this location. Then, after all other meeples have been placed for the round, the meeple placed on the first player spot has the opportunity to be moved to one remaining space somewhere else on the board, taking the action there as usual. 
Now, before we talk about all of the major actions that you can do on the main board, it's prudent to come back and talk about your player board and all of the different resources and attributes that you'll be trying to meet on here. Firstly, we'll talk about your three dials, humanity, reputation, and expertise. In the game, where you see one of these icons as a benefit for an action, that means you'll be able to move up one space on the corresponding dial. Humanity represents the balance between the good and bad things that you're doing in this game. Reputation represents your standing as a scientist in the community, and expertise is how capable you are at building the creature. Around the edges of each of these dials, you'll see a series of benefits or disadvantages printed. And this will be what you gain depending on where your dials are located. Each dial shows a series of victory points, and this will represent the number of victory points that you will gain or lose at the end of the game, depending on the final position of your dial. As you move up or down the humanity dial, you will either gain or lose points on the reputation dial. As you move up the reputation dial, you'll improve your meeples. Reaching seven immediately gives you a new assistant, and then reaching 11, 16, and 20 lets you swap out for an assistant for a full scientist. And as you move up on the expertise dial, not only will you be able to create more complex body parts for your creature, but you'll be able to change out gray dice for blue dice, which are more favorable, when you attempt to animate your creature. But we'll come back to that later. It's important with your in-game benefits to remember that if you ever lose humanity or reputation, you may lose the benefits that came with it. For example, doing an action here that costs humanity also costs the reputation that was just gained, and therefore forces the player to switch that scientist back down to an assistant. Finally, if your humanity ever drops all the way down to the negative 10 position, you'll see a lock icon. Your humanity is locked there for the rest of the game, you can never gain or lose more, and you will lose these 20 points at the end of the game. Once you've fallen that far, you can never come back. Next, we'll talk about the materials that you'll be gathering to create your creatures. There are five types in the game. Muscles, which are brown. Organs, which are purple. Blood, which is red. Animal parts, which are orange. And bones, which are white. Whenever you gain bones, they're placed into this box. All other types of parts are placed into one of these four locations on your board. These represent different states of decay. Stage one is the freshest material, and stage four is the oldest. Through the game, you'll be gaining these materials primarily by resolving cadaver cards. Resolving any cadaver card will give you two options, either to gain expertise or to gain materials. Thematically, you can consider this as being dissecting the body to improve your expertise, and this one to be simply taking that body for its materials. If you take the materials from a cadaver, refer to the bottom strip. This will tell you what materials you gain and how fresh they are. So for this cadaver, you would gain four muscles, three organs, two blood, all at stage one, as well as four bones which don't have stages. Anytime you resolve a cadaver, the card is returned to the bottom of the pack from which it came. There are a couple of restrictions on your board. You may never hold more than 12 bones at once, and you may never hold more than 15 parts of a given freshness at any time. Through the game, these will get older and older as they decompose, but we'll talk about that later. So now we're going to take you through all of the different action spaces on the main board where you can get materials. And we're going to take you through them in order from least fresh to most fresh. The worst quality parts come from digging up corpses at the cemetery. To do this, draw three cards from the top of the cemetery cadaver deck. The cadavers that you'll find at the cemetery are stage three, stage four, or skeletons which yield only bones. Some of the cadavers here will require you to lose one humanity to take them, but not all cadavers have this cost. You may resolve any or all of the cadaver cards that you've drawn, and then return them to the bottom of the cemetery pile. The next freshest cadavers come from the morgue, and to visit the morgue you must pay one coin to the supply. 
then draw two cards from the Morgue Cadaver deck and resolve them in the same way that you would have at the cemetery. Morgue Cadavers are either Stage 2 or Stage 3, and once again some of them will cost you a humanity to take. Resolve any or all that you wish to resolve, and then return them to the bottom of the Morgue deck. The next freshest cadavers come from the hospital, and specifically from this top action of the hospital space. At the start of each round, a number of cadavers equal to the number of players is placed face up in the hospital space, but you'll only be able to see the top one. Visiting this space allows you to take a number of cadavers depending on your reputation, based on the reputation dial on your player board. A player with 1 to 6 reputation gains nothing. A player with 7 to 14 reputation gets to take the top cadaver from the stack and resolve it. After taking the expertise or the materials, put the card back on the bottom of the hospital deck which sits off to the side of the board. The stack of available cadavers will not be replenished until the next round. If you have a reputation of 15 or above, then once again you can take one card for free, but you also have the option to take a second card at the cost of one coin. Cadavers at the hospital are all at stage 1 or 2, and you will not lose humanity by taking these cadavers. The freshest publicly available cadavers come at the public square in a round where an execution occurs. To visit here, the player pays one coin and then takes one of the cadavers, remember there will be two in a three or four player game and only one in a two player game, taking that and then resolving it. These are all stage one cadavers and come with a lot of materials. After resolving, you'll return the card to the bottom of its pile off the board and you will not replenish until the start of another round with executions. There are a few other less conventional ways to get your materials. You can, if you're happy with animal parts, visit the slaughterhouse, where you can get three level one animal parts or four level twos. You can go and visit the docks to hire somebody else to get you some materials. Anytime you do this, you'll pay the cost for that particular scoundrel, which is shown up in the top left corner of the card, and then resolve the bottom of the card exactly as you would for a cadaver. Cutthroats will head out and get you some level 1 materials in a way you probably don't want to know about. Hospital thieves will head to the hospital and steal some cadavers from there. The bone man is going to dig up some skeletons. Body snatchers will get you some stage 3 materials. And dog catchers can get you some more animal parts. Note also that resolving a dog catcher will give you a unique third option of improving your humanity. He catches the dogs and you let them go freely. When you hire somebody at the docks, return the card to the bottom of the docks pack and then immediately replenish it. Your final option is your most grim. You head to the dark alley and take matters into your own hands. You'll gain some very fresh level 1 materials, but you'll lose 3 humanity and you'll gain the attention of the police. Take one of these police badges. The police are now onto you. Once you have two of those badges, they're not going to let it slide anymore. And you can't take this action again unless you pay three coins to make the whole problem go away. Note that the dark alley is the only space on the board where you can gain materials that is restricted to only your scientist. You're not willing to get your poor assistants mixed up in this mess. Next, we'll talk about the research and atonement cards, which can be gained at the Academy and the St. Roche Church. To gain a research card, you'll do either the advanced research or the research action. If you choose advanced research, you will also gain an expertise by doing the action. Then, choose one of the two face-up research cards above the Academy, and take it into your collection. Immediately replenish it from the top of the Academy deck. The St. Rose Church works in the same way. You'll place your worker. If it is your scientist, you will gain one humanity and then draw from the two humanity cards on the board into your collection. Again, replacing from the top of the St. Rose deck. You may hold at most three of each type of card and must discard one down to two before drawing another third. Each of these cards, both the atonements and the research, have a once-off effect that you can play. Upon playing the card, return it to the bottom of its relevant deck. 
Some cards can be played at any time for an immediate bonus. Some cards can only be resolved in certain circumstances. For example, this one, a player may go and buy a cadaver after a public execution, but instead of taking the normal effect, simply gain what's shown on the card. Generally speaking, the research cards further your own statistics and experience, while the humanity cards, in addition to improving your humanity, are sort of take that cards which will impact other players' games. Thematically, you can think of this as improving your own humanity by dealing with all those other players' horrible, nasty experiments, even while you still carry on your own on the side. Each of the research cards also has an alternative effect, which relates to dice mitigation when you're trying to activate your creatures. But we'll come back to that later. It's important also to know that three of the humanity cards in the deck are these ones, the Aid Captain Walton cards. Playing one of these cards allows the player to gain humanity and advance the round marker one space before removing this card from the game entirely rather than returning it to the deck. This means that while the game can go a maximum of 12 rounds, if all three of these cards get drawn and played during the game, it's only going to go 9. These cards cannot be played once you've reached round 11, so you'll always be able to plan those last couple of rounds of the game without fear of this coming up. There are two other action spaces at the Academy. Lecture, which allows you to send a worker in order to gain money and one or two reputation. And Donate, where you can exchange one to three money into the same amount of reputation. There are also two other spaces available at the hospital both of which are open only to the scientist. The player can work in order to gain a certain amount of money depending on his or her expertise, or can volunteer to gain a humanity and two reputation. The last space on the main board is the market, and this is where players can go to gain or spend money. A player who visits the market may perform any of these four trades as many times as he or she wishes. Players may sell two bones, to gain one coin. Players may sell three preserved muscles or organs for two coins. These preserved muscles and organs must come from this box of your player board, not these boxes up here. And we'll talk more about that again in the lab phase. The player may spend two coins to take a laden jar. Laden jars are placed onto one of these four slots on the player board on the uncharged side unless the event in this round had a lightning storm in which it comes to you already charged up. Finally, the player may spend one coin for a block of ice. The ice block is placed into this spot on your player board and it helps to keep your parts from decomposing. If you purchase a new block of ice when your ice is on the half melted side, don't take a new token, simply flick it back to the main side. Finally, there are four action spaces available on your player board to use. The practice space allows you to gain more experience. Giving blood is essentially taking blood out of your own body for your experiments, and so you'll gain three blood cubes in stage one. The repair action, which only a scientist can do, allows you to take three damage tokens off your creature. We haven't spoken about those yet, but we'll see them shortly. Finally, charging laden jars allows you to flip two or three laden jars over to the charged side, depending on which sort of meeple you use. Now that we've gone through all of the different types of actions you can take in the city phase, we'll proceed to the lab phase. The lab phase of the game comprises three steps. Building monster parts, attempting to animate those parts by throwing the switch, and then preserving materials down here to sell in the market in the next round. So let's go through each of these in sequence. First, we'll talk about building a monster part. And this requires your helper card, which shows start a monster part on one side and complete a monster part on the other. When starting a part, you'll be trying to create a new part on your monster on the muscle side up. And then to complete it, you'll be aiming to flip it over to the skin side. So let's say the player wants to start a leg. First, Check how much expertise is required to construct that body part. In this case, it's five, and make sure you've moved far enough up the wheel. The lowest expertise required is three to create an arm, while the highest 
is 18 to complete a head. Next, you'll need to take these components. In this case, it's four muscles, two organs, and four bones. These components can come from anywhere on your player board except for the preserved materials box. Take and discard the relevant components. So here, it was four muscles, two organs, and four bones. Return those to the main supply. Then score a number of victory points based on this table, depending on the oldest material that you put into that body part. As I showed it before, I used only level one and two parts, and so my leg would be worth five points. Had I used even only one stage three or four part, it would have been worth only three points. What you'll note when completing a monster later in the game is that to get maximum points, all of the parts must be level one. Anything level two or below will result in a drop in points. A player may choose to use animal parts to substitute for any human part, including bones. So if trying to produce a leg from these components, the player could use these two muscles plus these two animal parts, as well as these organs and bones, to complete the leg. Once again, the victory points you gain will come from the column corresponding to the least fresh component that you used. However, additionally, if you used any animal parts to make that monster part, you will lose the points shown in this column. It doesn't matter whether you use a single animal part or if you construct a head entirely of old rats, you'll still only lose the number in that column. The only exception to the rule regarding animal parts is that you cannot use stage 3 or 4 animal material to substitute for blood. And this is because blood, once it decomposes to stage 3, is discarded. Add the part token to the board, or flip it over if you are completing the part, and then increase your expertise by one step as a result of the success that you've just had. You may construct or complete as many parts as you can afford in the same lab phase. After you've finished building monster parts, you have one opportunity per lab phase to throw the switch and attempt to animate your body parts. Flip face down between one and three charged Leyden jars. Then take a number of grey dice equal to twice the number of jars you discharged. For each blue die icon that you've reached on your expertise track, you may substitute one grey die for a blue die. Then roll the dice. For each single or double lightning bolt symbol that's been rolled, you must apply one damage token to one of your body parts. Each body part can hold no more than one damage token, and so if it ever takes a second, then it will either regress from its completed state to its incompleted state, or be discarded. Remember that you've got one action space which allows you to repair up to three damage tokens. For each of the loss of humanity icons you roll, you must lose one humanity. And finally, for each alive symbol that you roll, you can place an It's Alive token onto one completed body part. Each body part can hold no more than one alive token, and if you have more symbols than you have places to put them, then you simply lose the leftover symbols. The blue die has much better odds than the grey one, as it has two alive icons on it, and it doesn't have either of these two bad icons. Body parts do not immediately score points when you bring them to life, but they will score points at the end of the game if they're still alive. This number of points is shown on your Complete a Monster Part card. You may only attempt to throw the switch once per turn, and you must choose how many jars you're going to discharge before making the roll. However, remember that if you've been collecting research cards from the Academy, you can spend these to mitigate some bad outcomes on your die rolls. The final step of the lab phase is to preserve muscles and organs in order to sell them at the market in a subsequent round. You may take any muscles or organs from anywhere on your player board and add them to this space, with the restriction that you cannot have more than nine cubes in that square. You can think of this as putting the organs into jars of brine or something like that. You're no longer able to use them on your monster, but you can sell them at the market. 
then proceed to the reset phase. Each player with a full ice block flips the ice block to the half melted side. Each player with half an ice block discards the token. And then anyone with no ice must decompose his or her organs. Each cube is moved one slot to the right. Any material from phase 4 is discarded. It has decomposed to nothing. Phase 3 moves to 4, phase 2 moves to 3, and phase 1 moves to 2. Any blood which crosses from phase 2 to 3 is also discarded. Discard all face-up cards from the main board, putting them on the bottom of their respective decks, and then replenish them to their start of round conditions. Retrieve all meeples from the board, and advance the round marker one space. You're now ready for the next round. Through the game, players should take note of the four bonus objectives available. Each of these will be worth 10 victory points. Some of them will be evaluated only at the end of the game, while others will go to the player who is first to achieve a certain objective. So for example here, the first player to reach 10 on the humanity dial would take this tile to claim the 10 points at the end of the game. The game can end in one of two ways, either by the round marker reaching the skull space on this track, or by one player successfully animating all six monster parts. Once this happens, proceed to end game scoring. For each alive body part that is still alive at the end, the player adds the number of points based on this column of the table. Players will gain 10 points for each bonus objective tile that they've completed. Players add points based on which bonus they've reached around their humanity, reputation and expertise styles. Finally, if the end of the game was triggered by the round marker, and not by someone fully animating a monster, whoever has the highest humanity gains 5 points. The player with the highest score wins, and in the event of a tie, whoever has the most alive monster parts wins. If still tied, most leftover money. And if still tied, whoever is earliest in final turn order. And that's how to play Abomination the Era Frankenstein. We hope that you enjoyed this video and we hope you enjoy playing. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know by clicking the like button, write your questions or feedback in the comment sections below. You can also join our Facebook group, Maple University Community, to share your love for board games. And finally, if you'd like to be among the first notified of what's new from Meeple University, please consider subscribing to our channel. You can click on the Meeple up in the corner to do so, and do hit the bell to be notified of new videos. Until next time!